All right, welcome folks to Unit 5. We're going to talk about surplus tonight. But as usual, before we go running into that, let's go ahead and review what we covered last week in Unit 4. So, you might recall that we started off with a situation where you had been promoted and uh, you were now responsible for increasing the amount of revenue that a particular operation had. You had a starting point of what the price was and what the quantity sold was and your job was to increase that total amount of revenue. And the question was, are you going to raise prices or are you going to drop prices? Uh, if you raise prices, you know, the customers you have are going to pay more. Uh, but if you lower prices, maybe you'll get more and more customers. So we had to figure out a way to attack that problem. And what we ended up doing was we did an experiment where we measured the price elasticity of demand. Now that's fancy words for saying what we're looking at is how much of a change in customers or sales do we get when we make a certain percent change in price. So we make a given change in price, we figure out what is the change in number of customers or number of sales. And we saw that we could have a, a, a demand line between those two prices, which could be relatively straight up and down like this one is. Okay. And uh, we actually went through what the calculation was using the midpoint method. And you did have a hints document in doc sharing, which should have walked you through the calculation in great detail. So in the grading that I'm going to be doing on that, I expect everybody to get 100% on that part. So uh, we saw, though, that when the computation is made, that you could get a very small number, a number much smaller than 1. And again, remember, in this case, the minus in the, let me see if I'm not sure I can droodle it here or not. Let's see if I can get to it. Doot, 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 doot. 10 and we'll put a color up here okay so notice that we had a an answer of minus 0 0.26 what the minus is telling us is that the as we raise price we lose sales the 0 0.26 is the actual answer to the price elasticity of demand and what we see is the number is much smaller than zero. And what that's really telling us is the slope of this curve is relatively more straight up and down than it is relatively flat. So if the number is smaller than zero, then or smaller than one, I should say, uh, then you have uh, what we call inelastic demand. And we'll see that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Okay, uh, we saw as we made compu as we had different price ranges, that as we got a very high price range and we made that same computation, now we get an answer that is much bigger than zero. In this case, it's 6.56. Again, remember we're not counting the minus sign, and what we find is our new curve is much closer to flat than it is straight up and down. Okay, and so that was what it was telling us and what we see if we have that kind of a slope to our demand curve that we're going to lose so many customers if we raise our prices that we're going to actually lose revenue and we saw that happen right here in our total revenue we saw that we lost a lot of revenue at that very high uh, uh, price range and, and increasing the price further so that said what else do we, we saw that there's quite a range of uh, price elasticities of demand for the same product. And what it depends on is how high the price is. When the price is relatively low and you have a given percent change in the price, you're probably not going to lose very many customers. But as that price gets higher and higher and higher, you're going to cross some threshold where above that price range when you raise the price again by the same percentage you lose a lot more customers 
and again it depends on the product where those price ranges where those that that break point is okay so uh, what we saw is that if we have a price elasticity smaller than one and we want to increase our revenue then we need to raise prices because we're not going to lose very many customers when we're in that price range but the opposite happens if we're in uh, if our answer is bigger than one then if we want to increase revenue what we want to do is lower our prices because that way we're going to get so many more customers that now will increase our uh, total sales our total revenue so that was price elasticity of demand uh, we also saw that there's another kind of elasticity of demand that we refer to as income elasticity of demand and what that really refers to is now if we have an income elasticity of of demand that is a positive number this time the plus or minus sign counts so if it's a plus sign what it means is the richer people get in other words the more disposable income that people have if their income elasticity of demand for a given product is a positive number a plus number they're going to buy more of that and you might remember I used the example of uh, uh, you know going out to dinner at a really nice restaurant uh, if you don't have a whole lot of money you might only go to a really nice restaurant once every three or four months uh, if you get a really good job after you graduate and you get promoted and all and things are going really well and you're making good money you might find that you go out to nice restaurants a little more frequently maybe even once every couple weeks or once a week so uh, in that case you would have a positive income elasticity of demand for going to restaurants because the richer you got the more you went okay the opposite of that happens if the product that you're getting uh, or that somebody is getting if as they get richer if they buy less of it and in that case the income elasticity of demand will have a minus sign on front of it saying the richer people get the less they buy of that and again I use the example of a really inexpensive fast food joint uh, you know people that don't have a, or maybe ramen noodles might be an even better example uh, you know I, I, you hear stories of uh, you know poor college kids living on ramen noodles okay and spam uh, and obviously you know as they progress in life uh, and they get wealthier and wealthier they buy a lot less of ramen noodles and a lot less of spam okay so that's an example of a negative income elasticity of demand okay then we started talking about marginal utility a strange concept what it really relates to is how much satisfaction you get from the next one of the thing you're getting okay? and we found that the first one you get a lot of satisfaction from and we call that the way to measure that uh, we call it marginal utility marginal because it relates to that one thing that one burger and utility as another word for satisfaction so you see with one burger uh, we get let's see if I can do this we get 90 <laughs> marginal utilities or 90 units of satisfaction but as we get more and more burgers that same day we're going to find that each one gives us progressively less satisfaction than the one before it okay and so we call that the law of diminishing marginal utility the more we get of an item the next item that we get of that thing will give us less satisfaction than the item before it did now we found that it was not just enough to measure the marginal utility that the thing gives us but oftentimes we're comparing how much satisfaction we get from each dollar that we spend to buy things so if we're comparing two things 
then we want the marginal utility per dollar to be as close to equal as possible. Well, but to figure that out, we have to figure out what the marginal utility per dollar is. So all we did in this case was we took the price and we divided it into the marginal utility for that particular item. So the first item had 90 mar um, total of uh, 90 marginal utility. So its marginal utility per dollar becomes 30 because we divided three dollars into the 90. So we have a marginal utility per dollar. But we notice that our marginal utility per dollar follows that same rule of diminishing marginal utility. Uh, the more we got, the less marginal utility it gave us. Okay. So then we wanted to compare, see what happened when we got two items. And each item gives us different kinds of utility. So here we were comparing drinks uh, with uh, burgers. And we found in this particular case that if the person got the third burger and they were willing to give it 30 marginal utility uh, and they got the second drink but they were only willing to give it 15 marginal utilities and we divided by the price of each then we got uh, in this particular situation both of them had 10 marginal utilities. What that tells us is that we are now maximizing our marginal utility per dollar. So each dollar is doing the most, giving us the most satisfaction it can in buying those two things. Now you say, ah, this is malarkey, nobody does this. Well, you do, you just don't do the numbers, okay? Every time that you're spending money on something, remember we talked about this at the beginning of the course, as you spend money on something, there's something else that you could have spent that money on that you didn't. And as you buy two things, you split that money between the two things in a way that will give you the most satisfaction. And believe it or not, you actually subconsciously figure out how much satisfaction per dollar it's going to give you. So, uh, you do it, you just don't realize you do it, and everybody does. What we've done here is we've quantified an example just to show you how we would go about analyzing that, but it tells us something important. It tells us that the more of something we get, the less satisfied we're going to be with it, and as we split between two things, there is some combination that will give us the very most satisfaction. And if we alter that combination of how many of each things we get, we're not going to be as satisfied. Okay. So, uh, that said, we'll move along a little further. So, that basically covers what we discussed last week in Unit 4. If you have any questions, make sure you get a hold of me and let me know. So what we're going to talk about tonight is surplus, but this is a little different surplus than what we talked about earlier. Um, you might remember when we were talking about uh, the perfectly competitive market, we said there would be no extra product left over that went unsold, no surplus of product. Here we're going to talk about something a little different. So to get to that, I'm going to work my way through an example, and I'm going to pretend that uh, we're looking at music CDs, a particular kind of music CD, the one I like, which uh, happens to be uh, Sergei Rachmaninoff's music. And to me, his very best piece of music is one that you'll, you may hear in one of the future seminars. It's what I call uh, Owl of the Dead is its name. Uh, but anyhow, a really, really good recording of a, of a great symphony orchestra doing Isle of the Dead, that would be a CD worth buying and I would be willing to pay 30 bucks to get that CD of Sergei Rachmaninoff. Now, Rachmaninoff also did his number two piano concerto and that's a piece of music I dearly love also. Not quite as much as I like the uh, Isle of the Dead, but I really like that one and I fancy on my bucket list that someday I'm going to learn to play the piano and that's the piece I want to strive toward being able to play. 
Now that's a virtuoso piece. I don't know that I can ever get there, but that's one I'm interested in. So if I already had the CD of the Isle of the Dead and I was had been willing to pay $30 to buy it. Now, if the store had that piano concerto number two, I might be willing to spend another $25 to get that one. It's not quite as valuable to me as the first one. I'd be willing to spend $25 for that one. And then we get down to some of his other music. Uh, and I might be willing to buy another CD of his that has some other pieces that are maybe not quite so well known. I'd only be willing to pay $20 for that. And then we go on a little further. And there's a fourth CD that might be an interesting compilation of some of his work that would have the other two that I really, really like. And uh, I might only be willing to spend $4 or $15 for that one and so on. So there are several records that might be or CDs that might be available. Uh, finally, I might get to one that, you know, they have a seventh CD uh, that is uh, not one of the best orchestras playing his music and are not playing his most popular music. It's, it's some, you know, less well-known music. Uh, if the price was five dollars, I might go ahead and buy that. And then they've got some other really poor stuff and you know on on a cd and i wouldn't spend any money for that one i just wouldn't buy it so what we've done is we've created my demand schedule for that particular artist's cds okay uh now uh so we've created this demand schedule let's go to the next step and um, what does those what does that really really say well, it says that if the price of the CDs, the, the first CD, was more than $30, I wouldn't buy it at all. So I'd buy none. Okay. Uh, I would be willing to buy the first CD if the price was $30. I'd be willing to buy the second CD if the price was $25. So you see, all I'm doing is putting in a table uh, the demand schedule of what I was telling you I was willing to do with these particular CDs. Okay, so and we get down to the sixth CD, and even if it was free, I wouldn't buy the seventh CD. Okay, so now the question is, I get to the music store, and the price is only twenty dollars per CD. How many CDs would I buy? So, so we see that uh, I was willing to spend more than that twenty dollars for the first one, and I'm willing to spend more than twenty for the second one, and I'm willing to spend twenty for the third one. So, therefore, I'm going to buy those three CDs. Okay. Well, on the first CD, on on the uh, anything above thirty dollars, there's nothing there. Okay. So it's not a not applicable, uh, but we get down to the to the uh, first CD, and we see the price was twenty. I actually saved ten dollars, so I've got a total savings right now of ten dollars. I buy the second CD. I would have been willing to spend twenty five for it. Only had to spend twenty, so now I save an extra five dollars. Now I have a cumulative savings of fifteen dollars. And then I go ahead and buy that third CD, but I don't save anything because I was willing to spend 20 for it, and I had to pay 20. So I have a total savings above what I was willing to spend of $15. Now that extra savings, because I had been willing to pay more than what the selling price was, is what we refer to as consumer surplus. Keep that in mind. Okay. Now, what happens if the price was $10? Well, obviously I'm going to buy those first three. I'm also going to buy the fourth one and the fifth one. And now, when I crunch the numbers, and I'll put these up pretty quickly, because I think you can see the logic of the math. Okay. Uh, and we see that I buy all five of those CDs, 
on the fifth one I was only willing to spend ten dollars the price was ten dollars so I don't save anything on it but I have a total savings now of fifty dollars over and above what I would have been willing to spend it'd be the same thing as though you were ready to go to uh, to a store you're gonna buy a dress or in case of a man you're gonna buy a suit and you were planning on spending a hundred dollars on that dress or that suit okay you knew about it you'd already looked at it and it was just the dress you wanted or the suit you wanted and it cost a hundred dollars and so you got your hundred dollars in your hand you head to the store you're ready to go buy it and you get there and they're having a sale and it's only seventy five dollars instead of a hundred well you're definitely gonna buy it but look at the money you saved you saved an extra twenty five dollars that's consumer surplus Okay, so what happens if they were to have uh, all you want to buy for a certain price? Kind of like a restaurant having all you can eat for a certain price. Well, here we're going to assume that this record store has Rachmaninoff's albums, and they'll sell, as there's only seven of these available, they'll sell as many of them as you want, and the price they put for them was $75. $75, you get as many of them as you want. Okay? What are you going to do? How many are you going to buy? Well, if I look at the whole stack, all seven or six of them, okay, uh, or seven in this case, I was willing to spend a total of $105 to get all those CDs. If the price was $75, I'm definitely going to buy it. Okay, there is no doubt in my mind about that. Okay, and my total savings or consumer surplus would be $30. That's going to be that total that I save above what I was willing to pay for the price. Now, let's take a different example. Let's say the store wants to sell, uh, comes up with an all you can get price. This time they're charging $150. So you can buy as many of these CDs as you want for $150. Okay. Well, what's my situation then? Well, I was only willing to spend $105. Okay. I'm probably not going to spend any. I'm not going to buy any of them. Because if I did, I would spend more than $45 more than I was willing to spend. And it wasn't worth it to me. Okay, so therefore, I would not enter into that deal. Why? Because the all-you-can-eat, all-you-can-get price is too high for what I'm willing to spend. Okay, now the reason I mention this is you will see an assignment problem that relates directly to this computation. Okay, it won't be CDs. But uh, matter of fact, I think it's, I think it's shrimp. Or, no, it's not shrimp. It's Happy Meals. Anyhow, whatever it is, ch chicken nuggets or something. But you'll see it in the assignment. Okay, with that, let's move on to another topic. Okay, or another way of looking at this. We've talked about the consumer surplus. Now let's talk about suppliers. And let's pretend that uh, you have a small business you make and sell solar photovoltaic cells those little ones that you can use to charge your cell phone or to you know charge a, a, a you know a lawn light you know a, a, a landscaping light something like that okay and uh, and let's let's say it's an industry let's just say it's more than just you that there are many 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 businesses that make these particular solar panels and sell them and if the price were $35 for each one of them that all these suppliers together would be willing to, to sell up to 7,000 of these photovoltaic cells okay so we go a little further and we see as the price decreases it goes down that you know, we have, we lose some sellers. Some sellers drop out of the market, either because they are not as efficient 
or for whatever the reason is. They, they can't make as much money. It costs them more to produce or whatever. So we see when the price drops to 30, eh, some of them drop out, but there's still 6,000 available in the marketplace. Price drops to $25, more of the sellers go by the wayside and quit selling, but there's still 5,000 in the, in the marketplace, down from seven. When the price gets to 20, some of the suppliers would be willing to sell 4,000 of them, okay? But we're losing some. But as the price goes down, there's still some suppliers that are willing to supply. So at $10, we have only a few suppliers left, and they'd only provide 2,000. And if the price dropped to $5, there'd only be one supplier, and he'd only be willing to supply 1,000 of them. You say, well, why would he be willing to supply when the other ones were quitting? supply. Uh, and you'll see when we do the uh, cost studies that there's a cost point where it doesn't make sense to produce anymore. We call it our shutdown price, but we'll talk about that later. Anyhow, in this particular situation, what we see is maybe this particular supplier had a big inventory of them that he hadn't sold already. And so he wants to get rid of that inventory and he's even willing to accept $5 a piece for them there's some reason so but the thing is that there are different levels of efficiency and different reasons why suppliers might be willing to accept a lower price now and of course if the price drops to zero nobody's going to supply any now what happens if the price in the marketplace remember we, we have an equilibrium price if the equilibrium price is twenty dollars what's going to happen well Obviously, we're going to have the people who are willing to sell at $20, those 4000 but the people who are willing to sell at $15, they're going to sell at 20 but they're making five extra bucks. Okay, And the people who are willing to sell at $10, they're going to stay in the marketplace, but they're making 10 extra dollars off each one they were willing to sell. And likewise, the guy that was willing to sell for $5, <laughs> Well, you know, he's willing to take 20 for sure. He's going to make $15. So what we're seeing is there are some suppliers who were willing to sell at a price lower than the equilibrium price set by the marketplace. And those suppliers are going to make extra profit. We call that extra profit producer's surplus. Producers surplus. Just think of it as extra profit that some of the suppliers make because they would have been willing to sell at a lower price. Okay, so we've hit on a couple new concepts. Let's carry it a little further, or let's let's kind of sum things up a little bit. Uh, what all do we need to accomplish this week? Well, we only have one chapter this week. We have chapter four. Uh, and we're going to do more with this consumer surplus and supplier surplus next week. So bear that in mind. Don't, don't give up on it. Okay. Uh, but we're just introducing the concept so that you're able to answer some questions about that. Do make sure you look at my hints for this week's assignment. Okay. Because it's going to explain some things that you'll need to know also. Okay. So let's take a quick look at... The example I was using earlier is actually what you're going to do in your discussion thread. We're going to figure that there was a special dress or a suit that you were willing to buy and you were willing to spend $200 for it. But you get to the store and the price is only $150. But on the flip side of that, the store had been willing to go as low as $100. In other words, if they hadn't sold it at $150, the next week they were going to lower the price to $100. Okay? So what you're going to do is discuss that consumer surplus that was available to you and the producer surplus that was available to the store and, uh, uh, and then relate it to some other examples that you might know about in the real world. So, the hints are printed and laid on your desk. All right. Uh, what is our assignment going to look like? 
Well, our assignment is going to have us looking at the marginal utility again, the price elasticity of demand. You're going to get to compute the midpoint method, set of numbers again. Now, it's not going to be hamburgers and Cokes, okay? But it'll be something that you'll get to compute the price elasticity of demand for and then explain it, okay? Uh, and they're going to give you a couple different price ranges, and they're going to ask you, why are the numbers different? What does it mean, and why are the numbers different? Okay, and remember that we had some breaking point as we raised that price bracket, uh, where we flip over to losing a lot of customers as we raise price. Uh, then we're going to talk about uh, diminishing marginal utility, okay? And then we're going to get at consumer surplus at different prices, okay? And I think that one is going to be the chicken McNuggets or chicken nuggets uh, question. So again, don't hold me to that. I might be wrong on that. Okay. Uh, I know tonight's going to be a somewhat more brief seminar than usual. Uh, so you know how to contact me. And I'm going to go ahead and put up this last slide so that you know what we're going to do in the future. And with that, I need to do...